Good morning, y'all. It's one of those mornings where chaos has broken out and I'm starting a little bit late. So the notifications won't go out for a couple of seconds, but we're going to go ahead and push the button and say, Hey, y'all. How you doing today? Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, happy Sunday to you. And, uh, Hope everybody is uh, ready and raring to go, kind of winding down the weekend, starting a new week. And uh, my audio is working, hopefully, <laughs> but I'm sure everybody will let me know if it's not. So we'll find out in just a minute. The latency, the lag between uh, YouTube and... Um, the live and the the chat and everything is sometimes pretty long. It's generally about a 30 second delay, but that's okay. So let's go down the list and see what's going on with everybody and see who's joining us. I see Ice Cream 62 over there in Italy. Hope you're doing well over there. I mean, this COVID thing just will not go away. Dennis Mills checking in. Dave Krause, nice to see you here again. Norm Peterson in the part of Reno that has not burned. Well, here's hoping you guys get a change in the weather and uh, that ends soon. We've had nothing but rain here for the past two weeks. So let's see. Uh, David Pingle checking in. I.L. Peleg from Israel, how you doing today? Steve Late over in the U.K., follow-up follow up appointment for his uh, open-heart surgery he recently had. Good to see you doing well. Mr. Michael Mazalik checking in. How you doing today? Uh, let see. David Blackburn and Jim Hester. Uh, John Gallant. Uh, your best bet to get a hold of me is go to my website. There's a link down in the description box below and click on the contact us page and send me an email through there. I read every message. I do get swamped at times, but uh, I try to I, I try to catch up as fast as I can. But uh, that's the best way to get a hold of me. Hit my website, click on the Contact Us page, and shoot me your email there, and uh, we can go from there. Uh, Bill Stoffer in Ohio. Mike Smith, Overcast Central Florida. Yeah, it's overcast here, too. Um, in fact, it's only 31 degrees right now, so it's kind of... Eh. Uh, let's see. Jeff there, Woody Wan, how you doing today? Richard Canton, Francisco Paz from down in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, motorsport, hope you're doing good. Rob Schuster, the man, the myth, the legend, the inventor, I like to call him. <laughs> He's got some good stuff going on, I'll tell you what. Uh, John Sautier, Richard Weiss, uh, Mark Kulig, Bruce Lund, Michael Johnston. Hey, how you doing? Haven't seen you around in a while. And Mr. Mario Medina, Gary Hammett, Dustin Fournier from Canada. Man, nice to see a bunch of familiar faces floating around. How y'all doing? Bud Hoffner, how you doing today? Okay, um, still working on gifts for the family and what have you, so I, I don't have a video today to share. Uh, but I do have... Um, something to show you that uh, I was asked in an email and I was asked in a live stream. And that was an easy way to arrange the numbers on a clock face. So I'm going to go ahead and show how I do it. Uh, it doesn't take very long, but there are about... Um, probably just slightly less than a bazillion ways of doing things in V Carve and Aspire. So I'm just going to show you how I do it. And so let me go ahead and bring up Aspire here 
and we'll make sure I'm screen sharing, which I am. Okay. Uh, basically, what I have here is just a square piece of material, and I have a circle drawn. This is my outer perimeter for the clock. The, I'm going to cut this out. This is my profile cutout. And I'll go ahead and check on the size here. We can see it's a 15 inch diameter. Now, I want to arrange those numbers inside here. I want them to be about an inch and a half inside the perimeter of my clock. So what I'll do is draw another circle inside here that is three inches smaller in diameter than this one here. So with this being 15, I'll come up here and draw a 12 inch circle, putting the center point on my zero zero layer. I'll go ahead and create it, but I should have done something else first. Right now I have one layer. I'm going to add a new layer and I'm going to call it markers. And when I hit enter, this becomes the active layer. I'm going to select that circle, right click, and I'm going to move it to the markers layer. I should have created that layer, then drawn this circle. I got a little bit ahead of myself. Now, we have obviously the 12 numbers on a clock face. There isn't really an easy way to place them all automatically. So what I'll do is I'll create another circle and I'll just make it uh, a quarter inch diameter just so it's easy for me to see but not really big and obtrusive and again we're on our markers layer I want to keep this on the separate layer and I'll come up to right here the intersection of my x0 and this circle this inner circle and I'll place that circle right there and I'll close that and with this circle still selected, I want to do a array copy, a circular array. The object size is not going to change. I want to put my rotation center, I want to rotate this array around my x0, y0. I want to rotate the copies, a total number of 12 around a 360 degree circle and I'll click copy. Then when I close that, I now have 12 circles on my guide circle here. And these are evenly spaced at the positions of the clock. Now I need to switch back over to layer one, make it active because what I, I'm going to place my text here, my numbers here on my uh, main top layer. And I'll just come over here to draw text and the first thing I'll do is I'll bring my text box up here and I want to place it in the center of that small circle. I've got my font selected here and for up here I want 12 then I'll come over and I'll click in the center of this circle and there's one. Click two. Click three. And then just go around and add all of my numbers. Until I have them all placed. Now I want to close that. Then I'll individually one by one, I'll come over here and click it, go into move and transform mode. I'll zoom in so you can see what I'm doing here. And I'll grab this center square and drag it down to the center of that circle. That just places that number right on the center of this circle and on the center of my guideline here. Or excuse me, places the center of my number on that guideline. Then it's a simple matter of going around and moving each number into the center of that circle. 
and I'm not going to do all 12 of them here. This is just a demonstration to show you how I get all of these placed. I'll go around and do all 12 numbers and get them placed so that they are centered on these smaller circles. Once I'm finished with this, I can go ahead, come over here, and save this as a template. So the next time I need to create a clock face, I can open this template file and I have my layout for this size already taken care of. Now I can also select everything and scale this down should I want to do that. Scale the whole thing down to let's say 12 inches click apply and it scales everything down but on these numbers I have already placed the placement doesn't change should I want to go in and change the font now you have to do this one at a time because the software will not let you select all of the text go back in here and change the font. It deselects your numbers. So you have to change them one at a time. So I've selected one. I'll come over here and change the font. Select two. Come over and change the font. Etc. But once you have this template created and you make any changes, you'll then come up and you'll save the file so you don't change your template. Then when it's time to calculate tool paths, all I need to do is come up here, make sure layer one is the active layer, turn off my markers layer, and that is all now hidden so I can select all my text, come over and do a v-carve tool path to carve out my numbers. It's a simple way to create a clock face template that you can scale, resize, change the fonts with, and as you can see it only takes a couple of minutes. And this is one of those things that if you set it up once and save it as a template file, it's done. You can come in and add any artwork you want in here. You can put artwork out here if you don't want to cut out this circle, make it a round clock. You can add 3D carvings. You can do more V carving wherever you want, personalize it. But you always have that clock face there that you can modify by changing fonts, changing sizes, adding or taking away artwork. So the main thing to remember is to put all your markers on a separate layer so that when it's time to toolpath anything, you just shut that layer off and you end the confusion. You can take it from there. So I hope that answers that question on setting up a clock face, laying it out, and creating a template that you can use repeatedly over and over and over again. So I hope that helps there. Um, it, John Gallant has the question here. I don't see the website in the description. There is a link down there, but uh, it's marklindsaycnc.com. I'll make sure to put a better link down there in the description once this goes into a normal video after we're done going live here. So, all right. So, um, I hope that answered that question with the uh, making a uh, clock template. And um, it's just, I'm all about easy. So if you do all the legwork once, and thankfully Vectric has come up with these template files, you do all the heavy lifting once, 
get that template file created, then the next time you need to do a clock, you can open up that template file and it's done for you right there. Then, you know, do your design work, add your V-carving, do your customization, and save it as a standard CRV or CRV 3D file. And it just, I'm, it streamlines the work, believe me. And you only have to do the math once. <laughs> you only have the figuring once. So, okay, uh, let's go back up here and see if we have any questions just general Q&A. Did anybody have any questions on the templates or creating template files or laying out a uh, clock face? And if so, just go ahead and put them in the chat and when I get down there to you, I'll answer them. Let's see. Richard Canton wants to know, is there, easy, is there an easy way to size and arrange text for vertical signs? Yeah, let me go back into Aspire and I'll show you something here. Uh, we'll go make sure I am screen sharing. I am. Um, I'll go ahead and just uh, delete all that. I don't necessarily need it. If you come up here into your text box and you go into your font list, you'll notice that some of these fonts have this at symbol, the first uh, character in the name. And what that at symbol does is it's a signal to the software that this is vertical text. So if I just pick, let's pick this font right here, for instance, you'll notice how my text box just flips sideways. That blue dot is not on the bottom. It's now on this corner. So I can come up here and type. And that text is sideways. It's, it runs vertical. Now, if you don't mean this way, because the text is running vertical, but the letters are turned 90 degrees. If you don't mean that way, if you mean just the each character being right side up, then there's a trick to doing that. Let me go back up here and grab a standard font, and we see my text box is back to being upright. I'll align my text in the center. I'm going to move this text block up here. You'll do each number on a, uh, each character on a separate line. So for my example, it would be H, hit enter, E, hit enter, L, enter, L, enter, O. So you have your text running vertical, but the characters are facing the right direction. Close that, and we'll go ahead and uh, center that up by pressing F9 on the keyboard. And now I can scale this up a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. Now you're talking about resizing. Even with this text running vertically like this, if you select each letter, just click off here, because it's one text object, all I have to do is select one. Your kerning tools still work. So I can click on um, Edit Text Spacing and Curve, and I can come in here between these letters and I can I can kind of close up this gap here and maybe close this up a little bit. And I need to close this one up a lot, so I'll just keep clicking to bring them together a little tighter. And the same here. All of these kerning tools work, even though you're running vertical text because it's reading this as separate lines of text. So from here, if you wanted to do any other customization, let's say for just for giggles, you wanted to kind of cant each of these letters in a different direction. Well, we can select the text object, right click, 
break text block into lines. So if I do that, each one of these letters is still a text object, but it's now a separate te text object. So I can click on this and I'm going to tap the number zero on my keyboard and turn that 45 degrees. Now I'm going to tap the number nine, turn that one 45 degrees counterclockwise, then zero to go clockwise, nine to go counterclockwise, and then zero to go clockwise. So each individual character is being read as a separate object. Now I'm going to hold down control and tap the letter Z to undo those changes. But I can then come along, grab these, and click again to go into move and transform mode, slide these straight down, then select this one, and scale it up a little bit to make it a little bit larger than the rest. Scoot it back over here to the center. So by making them, by using that break text block into lines, I've now made each individual character editable by itself. So I hope something in that answers that question. The two takeaways from this are if the font has the little at symbol as its first character, it is a vertical font. However, the, the text, all of each individual character will be rotated that 90 degrees to run vertically. If you want to run them vertically like this, put each character on its own line. And again, when it goes into text mode, it won't let me select multiples. I have to do them one at a time. But now each one is its own character or is its own text object since I split them into lines. So I hope that answers that question. Now let's get back over here to where you are so I can see what you're saying here. Um, is that, does that help, Richard? Is that what you were uh, talking about? Maybe one of those covered you. Okay, let's see here. Uh, David Blackburn says, uh, I know you have an acrylic video scheduled in the future, but I was wondering if you have any ideas about tools, feeds, and speeds. No, I don't. That's what I'm exploring myself. And I just haven't gotten into it yet. I've not yet perfected cutting out the, uh, the piece after I have it engraved. That's what I'm working on. And believe me, when I discover it, you will know. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Let me scoot down here. Um, I all pay leg says, aren't all the numbers offset by the same distance upward of the guide circle? Could you not measure that offset, then move them all as a group? I will look into that. I just find it easier to move each individual number. It only takes a couple of seconds and there's no math. So I will try that. And if it works out real well, I'll let you know. So. Uh, Jim Hester says, I tried this on the day of the week clock. The days that were at the bottom came in backwards. I tried mirror and flip. No luck. This way is so much easier. Thanks. Yeah, it. you just have to kind of play with it. And I, I try to think about it. Um, how would I accomplish this? I can't really automatically create a circular array of numbers but I can create a circular array of objects and then align those numbers to those objects. That's just kind of how my brain went. So let's see here. Um, 
Mark Kulig says off the subject, when you cut 3D items and the runtime is hours long and you don't have an air-cooled router, how long can your router really run for? Do you have any temp sensors on your router or motor? Um, if you're talking about a standard wood router, not a spindle, all of them are air-cooled. There is a fan built in and that's what all that air blowing through is. It's... Um, it, it, it's a cooling fan built in to keep that motor cooled down. The longest I have ever run my router, and just as a uh, as a reference, I use a Porter Cable uh, 890 series router on my CNC. It's um, the longest run I have had so far has been 14 hours. And there hasn't been a problem. Having said that, if you have a few hours on your router. Um, you might want to have an extra set of brushes for that router on hand. So, it, just in case. And I will occasionally take, on my router, I have to take the top off of the router to get down into it to check the brushes. I, occasionally, I'll pull that lid and see how much brush I have and uh, then put it back together. Because there's nothing worse than having a router fail because of worn brushes right in the middle of a cut. Because if that router stops, your control software doesn't know it stopped. And it'll keep going. And your bit, it'll break a bit, possibly damage your machine. So if you're going to be doing a long carve, I do a quick lube on my uh, lead screws. I check my bearings and couplers to make sure everything is all secure there. And then I look at the brushes themselves and see how long it's going to, you know, how much brush I have there. And brushes are cheap. I always have an extra set on hand. And when I install them in the router, I order another set that day or within the next couple of days. So I have an extra set on hand. And I don't forget to order another set. Um, each router is different. Like I said, I use a Porter cable. I know a lot of folks like the DeWalt, especially like the 611. Um, you can Google your router and model number. And then br with the word brushes, they're on Amazon. They're not expensive. I think I paid $16 for a set of brushes for mine. And... Um, you shouldn't have any problem with a router running for a long time. You know, obviously, it's going to depend on the weather because they are air-cooled. If it's 100 degrees in your shop, computers, generally speaking, don't like high temperatures like that anyway. Uh, so that might cause some heat issues. But the router should be able to run for long periods without any problems like that. My longest has been 14 hours, as I said, and there were no issues. So, let's see. Um, let's see. Jeff says, Woody Wan, when making a profile cutout with standard tabs, getting verti vertical lines on the project and start at finish of the tab, would 3D tabs prevent this? It will help. Um, I prefer to use 3D tabs, mainly because the X and Y axis don't stop moving. The, the bit will get around to where a tab is, and then the Z will kick in and lift up, and then go back down. And so the X and Y don't stop. Now, that that's only a, I mean, it may be only a couple of seconds worth of time, but it also prevents those little witness marks that you're getting where the bit stops and lifts up out of the cut, moves over for the tab, and then plunges back in. Another thing that helps on that is using a separate last pass. I will use a separate last pass with a uh, allowance of 0 0.1 which is 0 0.01, excuse me, 10 thousandths of an inch. And what it, what that does is it makes the first cuts 10 thousandths of an inch oversize, then on the last pass, 
it lifts out of the material, moves over that ten thousandths. And then if you have your ramps set, you should be ramping in. It will ramp in and make that last cut at full depth in one pass and remove all of the witness marks. It will continue to make the tab, but it makes that last pass in one, the full thickness of the material in one pass. And that's a nice clean cut. So ramping and 3D tabs will help you eliminate those witness marks where the bit is plunging into the material and then lifting out. So that's, uh, that's uh, just something that I picked up when I first got into this and uh, was a tip given to me by my buddy Dave Gatton. So Let's see, uh, I.L. Peleg says, uh, speaking of fonts, do you know if right to left Hebrew and Arabic works within the Vetric software? I do not, I.L. Uh, that's a good question for Vectric tech support. I, I don't know if they, if the software is available in Hebrew or Arabic, but if it is, they would be probably have to have support for uh, the right to left. Uh, but that's a good question for them. I really don't know. Hmm. Interesting. Let's see. Um, Mike Noland, a little off topic, but how's the new shop coming along? I've been busy and haven't had time to watch videos. Well, shame on you, Mike. Um, the new shop is uh, on hold uh, I, that was my last video just before I put the channel on hiatus for the holidays. I've got the gravel pad finished up to the uh, point of getting a plate compactor and compacting that gravel in nice and tight. And now it's going to be on hold until the spike in lumber prices comes down and the need here locally slows down just a little bit because of the fires we had back in the summer. So it's on hold probably until spring, but never say never. You never know. So let's, and thank you for asking, by the way. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Todd HC and C says he ran a Bosch 1617 for 14 hours. Yeah. That's that, you know, if it's a decent quality router, uh, it should have no problem running for that long because uh, that's what they're made for. So, let's see. John Gallant says, how long of a run time would you say for DeWalt 611 stock with an X-Carve? I don't know DeWalt routers, but I have never heard of anybody having a problem with the DeWalt 611. It's a very popular router. I've never heard of anybody having an issue on long carves. Uh, I don't know the router personally. I don't have one. But uh, I'd say just about anything that you want to run it on, you'd be fine. So, let's see. Jim Hester says, speaking of lube, what's a good one to use on lead screws and rails? Oh, boy. Here is a big controversy. I am going to take some flack right now, and I know it. I use white lithium grease and a lot of people are going to dive into the comments and say that attracts dust and dirt. Have you used a CNC? There is dust and dirt all over the lead screws anyway. And I don't smother it. I'm talking about I'll take my little finger and dab it in some white lithium grease, put it right in front of the lead nut on my lead screw and a little bit right behind it. Then I run it back and forth. I'm not trying to lube the entire lead screw. I'm trying to lube the lead nut. So by running that back and forth on a little slight amount of white lithium grease, it puts just enough on the lead nut itself that the entire length of the lead screw, it's just fine. I don't lube linear rails. Um, I know well, I, let me back up from that. I do too. I'll take a rag and I'll put a little bit of uh, pneumatic oil on it because I happen to have it in the shop anyway and just kind of wipe it down. But that's more of a rust preventative than anything else. Um, 
I use, I know a lot of folks don't like to use grease in a dusty shop environment, and that's a legitimate concern, but I don't use enough. I've been doing it for coming up on six years now, and I've never had an issue. Some folks like to use the silicone dry loop, and if that works for you, fine. Personally, I hate that stuff, and I will not allow it in my shop. I have had issues with finishing that you would not believe. It will create fish eyes. It's a serious problem when it comes to finishing. I don't allow it in my shop. Having said that, I do have some. I use it for metal-to-metal -metal contact like on door hinges or uh, the tailgate on a trailer or something like that. I do use it. I just don't want it in my shop. I don't want it contaminating wood. Wood and silicone don't mix. Um, I see Jeff just added, what about powdered graphite? Powdered graphite is a mess. If it works for you, go for it. But I know my luck. If I put powdered graphite on a lead screw and then all of a sudden my lead screw is covered in graphite, I'm going to lean up against it or I'm going to touch it and have graphite all over the place. I know me. <laughs> uh, just that tiny amount of white lithium grease that I use has worked for me just fine. Now, having said all that, follow your manufacturer's instructions. If your manufacturer says use silicone dry lube or Teflon dry lube, use it. If they say use a little bit of white lithium grease, use it. Follow their instructions first because you have warranty issues should you use something that they don't recommend. So follow their instructions first, always. Okay, let's see. And that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Um, let's see. Mike Smith was asking about where to get uh, Porter Cable brushes. Amazon. That's where I go. I just look up, for instance, for my router, Porter Cable 890 brushes. Or I also have a, a 690, Porter Cable 690 brushes. And they're not expensive. And it's always good to have an extra set on hand. Because brushes never wear out at a good time. But if you have them on hand and you kind of keep an eye on them, you can, generally, you can generally tell when they're getting pretty low. And if you haven't replaced your brushes yet, and you've had your router for more than six months, check them. And order another set. So... Uh, let's see. Okay. Mike Mazalik says, uh, the right to left does not work in the software. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, that may be something to, you know, we did not have the, uh, face to face 2020 users group meeting, um, Vectric users group meeting down in San Diego this year. They have it scheduled for 2021. And I've got my handy little list here of things that I'm going to ask them about. Little suggestions. That's a good one. Right to left text support. Uh, just a way to arrange. Because I could see other benefits in that too. But just right to left. Type it out and then arrange it right. To, yeah. That would be a good idea. I like that. <laughs> Uh, let's see, David Pingle comes in and says, my CNC manufacturer suggests three and one one oil. Then do that. Then do that. Uh, Dave Gatton, the man, the myth, the legend, my CNC Obi-Wan, um, says white lithium grease works fine. Been using it for years. There's the man that taught me. And I've been using it ever since I've had my first CNC. So uh, let's see. Dave Matthews brings up a good point. Right to left text may be handled by the Windows language settings. I don't know. I really don't know. It's, I've never needed that. I, I really don't know. Let's see. Um, Mark Kulik says, I installed a spoil board made of foam. Okay. Can you suggest what kind of bit I can use to flatten it out? 
<coughs> Excuse me. I've never heard of anybody using foam for a spoil board. Um, but any wood bit will work on foam. So whatever you would use to surface a wood spoil board, be it MDF, plywood, what have you, um, will work with foam. Personally, I have a, um, I'll put a link to it in the description. I have a Freud, it's technically a straight mortising bit, um, but it's an inch and a quarter diameter, and I use that to surface my spoil board. Um, all right. Myself a note here to put a link to the bit that I use down in the description of this video. But basically, any um, spoil board surfacing bit, if you just Google spoil board surfacing bit, you will find too many options. Believe me. And just find one that fits your router. Do know that if it's more than, say, an inch and a half in diameter, you're going to have to adjust your uh, router RPM down uh, because various reasons. But the larger diameter bits, you'll want to adjust your RPM down. So, But I'll put a link to the one I use in the description of this video when we get finished here see here uh david blackburn says sorry for another acrylic question do you think ca glue and masking tape will work for hold down it okay i'm going to put a caveat on this almost all acrylic in fact all acrylic comes with a either a paper or a plastic coating on it i would not trust using the masking tape ca glue and burnishing it on that coating, that protective layer. It's not made to stick securely to that. It's made to be easy to pull off. So you would have to pull off that protective layer, be it paper or plastic, and then use the tape and C glue, CA glue straight on the acrylic itself. I don't know if I'd be comfortable with that. Um, Michael Johnston says... Uh, for acrylic hold down, I normally corral it. That way you have minimal touching of the acrylic sheet. And that's exactly the point. Acrylic scratches real easy. Real easy. I mean, you can take a piece of nice clear acrylic, just a small sample, peel off that layer, and take a, the soft, a makeup brush, a soft brush that's made for sensitive skin, and brush it over there, and you can see it scratching that acrylic. So I'm a fan of leaving that protective layer on there as long as humanly possible. So, you know, um, it would work, but you'd have to take that layer off of the side you're going to face down. Just know you run the risk of scratching it. So, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I am. Um, Okay, the Dirty Knobs here. Interesting name. I use White Lithium 2, and I get about two and a half sets of brushes per router before it's drunk. Oh, before running, before burning out the router. Um, I've had my Porter Cable 890. My wife got me that for Christmas in 2007, and it's a workhorse. If uh, I love Porter Cable routers. They, for many, many years, have been the industry standards. If you blow out the motor when you're done with it with compressed air, change the brushes when they need it, they'll outlive all of us. They really will. I mean, if you have to replace a bearing, they're about $12. Um, I'm a major, major fan of the uh, Porter Cable router. So... I know people who use Porter Cable routers in industrial applications in professional cabinet shops that are 20, 30 years old and older, and they still use them every day. Blow out the motor, replace the brushes when it needs it, they'll outlive all of us. They really are workhorses. So, okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and call this good. Yes, John, I will put a link, but it's real easy. Mark at Mark, uh, MarkLindsayCNC.com is my website. Hit the contact us page. 
I'm going to go ahead and end this here. Um, next week, we'll do another live Q&A. And maybe I will remember to put the promo on Facebook this time and not wait till five minutes before I push the button. <laughs> uh, I'm going to keep going through my questions and finding your questions that I can do a short demonstration on in these live Q&As. And uh, so I don't know what I'm going to do next week, but um, hopefully it'll be uh, something useful. So if you have your questions, head over to the website, shoot me a mail through the Contact Us page, and uh, I'll uh, look into it and see what's going on, see if we can do a short demonstration. But until then, y'all have a good day. I will get these links put into the description uh, ASAP. And um, get out in the shop, make some chips. I got to quit hitting the ding-dong microphone with my hand. I'm expressive, and I know it. Bye, y'all. Y'all take care. <laughs>